Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Selling Greenville, your favorite real estate podcast right here in lovely Greenville, South Carolina. I'm your host, as always, Stan McCune, realtor here in Greenville, South Carolina, and you can find all of my contact information in the show notes if you need to reach out to me for any of your real estate needs. Um, If you're listening to this on Apple or Spotify or another platform app that allows you to do this, please subscribe to the show, leave a rating, and leave a review. That's all I ask of you guys. That and to use me as your realtor. Um, If you're watching on YouTube um, and you you found me by searching for my name, uh, please uh, subscribe to my channel. I'd appreciate that. I've got the the Selling Greenville playlist. Um, Don't search for Selling Greenville. By the way, don't search for that channel. Unfortunately, someone else has that. Uh, But please, if you could like the show, if you could even leave a comment, I would appreciate anything like that. Those types of of, uh, engagements, as they call it, um, are meaningful and just help this show in the algorithm, in the AI uh, that's out there that's causing different people to see different content. So um, I'd appreciate if you guys could do those things. Today, I want to talk about a uh, something that we've talked about before, but that is uh, really a, a a big thing for me, something that I'm very passionate about, and it is NIMBYism, NIMBYism. Um, and some of you will ultimately already know what this is. And in fact, it was a listener to the show. That was the first person I'd ever heard use this term NIMBY or NIMBYism um, because I don't personally use a lot of slang. But this is a a now has become a very commonly used phrase over the last several years. And um, and it's, it's worth using and it's worth discussing. And I want to discuss why the NIMBYs are wrong. Um, and I'm going to define what NIMBYism is here in just a second, but I just want to kind of set the stage to to begin with. And what that stage is, is that everything these days has gotten political and real estate is no exception. Everything in real estate has become political. And when you're talking about real estate and politics, there is one group that is by far the loudest group in the room. When you have a group of political real estate people, or even just people that are concerned about real estate in general or concerned about their house in general, um, and they have any sorts of political beliefs at all, there is one group that is louder than the rest, and that is the NIMBYs. What are or who are the NIMBYs? Um, NIMBY stands for, uh, it's an acronym that stands for not in my backyard, not in my backyard. And it refers to an increasingly large and powerful group of people who want to limit, and in many cases, stop all development near them. And in some cases, they're they're like anti-development in general, but generally speaking, they, they're primarily just concerned about development near them. And so hence the not in my backyard backyard idea. I'm okay with more houses going up in this part of the country or in this part of the city or in this part of the county. Just don't do it down the street from me. I don't want it. I I don't want new housing or new commercial real estate or new real estate, new development happening in general near where I live. And in an area like Greenville, the NIMBYs are particularly prominent uh, due to how much development we've seen in recent years in Greenville County and Greenville City and some of the surrounding counties, um, we, we have seen a lot of development. Like there's no denying that. Um, and, and so as a result, that brings the NIMBYs out, right? They are anti-development. They don't even, by the way, um, it, it, NIMBY is, is a more derisive term, right? They don't identify as NIMBYs. And a lot of them don't even know what that acronym stands for. Uh, but they are loosely defined. They they all have the the same mindset, and they tend to have uh, the same way of going about uh, wanting to change things. Um, so that's why they have been kind of lumped together as this uh, somewhat homogenous group. Now I mentioned before on here on the show that last year's 
2022's local elections were a major win for the NIMBYs because they got multiple anti-development people into Greenville County Council, or at least people that ran on anti-development platforms. Um, and if you go to uh, a, a, a different than, uh, if, sorry, if you go to a county council or a city council or a proposed rezoning hearing or a meeting, uh, you will sometimes and honestly frequently see rooms packed with loud, angry people waiting to stop any and all development near them. I've even heard stories of NIMBYs mobilizing to follow Pickens County Council members' home to harass them at their homes and in public. Like it's they're, they're completely unhinged. Like they are so passionate. It's almost like a, a cultic like passion. They're so passionate about this that they're willing to harass county council members in a rural county like Pickens. Um, uh, you've never heard anything like this. I've never heard anything like this. People that I know that have been in politics for decades have not heard of anything like this. So this is a very, uh, very, like I said, loud group, very passionate group. And in my opinion, they are wrong. However, I do want to say that they aren't just acting like this for no reason. And I'm going to discuss their reasons and why I think that their reasons are wrong. Now, I'm not saying that all of their concerns are completely uh, to be thrown out the window as if they have no concerns. Listen, one of the things that we talk about in Greenville all the time is smart growth, right? Growth has to be smart. Obviously, you can't just grow at this exponential pace forever and not give thought to what does this mean for our economy? What does this mean for our infrastructure? Um, but the concern that the NIMBYs have is that that smart growth isn't actually happening. And on that point, I think we can have a bit of a disagreement. Uh, but I'd like to discuss, that's like their broad concern, but I'd like to discuss some of the specific concerns that I have with the NIMBYs and why I uh, some of the specific concerns that the NIMBYs have and why I disagree with them uh, for the most part on those concerns. So let's start with the one that I hear the most often. We don't, this is in quotes, we don't want to be the next Charlotte. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this. We don't want Greenville to turn into the next Charlotte. Now, this is a legitimate concern from one standpoint. I saw a list recently that basically found a way to quantify the most poorly designed cities in all of the U.S. And Charlotte was the worst of the worst designed cities in the entire United States. So it's understandable that people would not want to be like Charlotte, which grew too fast and without a good plan in place for how to grow smartly. But listen, it's not like Charlotte went from a small, charming city like Greenville to a large city overnight. Charlotte has been a large city for quite some time. What happened was that Charlotte went from a medium-large city to a really, really large city over the course of several decades and didn't handle that growth well. This is not what we're seeing Greenville. Greenville is a small city by every metric. Uh, about 75,000 is the population of Greenville City. That is a small city by today's standards, uh, by every metric. And we simply couldn't become a Charlotte-like city anytime soon. I mean, look back at census data. How big was Charlotte in the 1940s when Charlotte was way smaller than it is now? Charlotte back then had a population of 100,000, which by the way, again, you have to compare apples to apples. 100,000 population in 1940 is a much bigger population than it is now, right? For a for a city, um, so that was a a decent sized city back then. And in comparison, Greenville is a city of seventy five thousand, so it's even smaller than Charlotte was back then. And that was eighty years ago. Greenville has a long way to go before it's going to look like Charlotte. Look at the photos of Charlotte in the nineteen forties. You can you can Google them. And, and look them up. There's some cool there's some cool black and white photography and whatnot from the 40s of Charlotte. And you can see right away that it's bigger than Greenville. It looks more comparable to like a Nashville back in the 1940s. And it was also laid out in a way that really set it up 
for substantial commercial development, just the way it was laid out. You could see, okay, if they want to expand this, they can very easily. Whereas Greenville, on the other hand, is not set up this way. It would take unbelievably massive changes to the infrastructure to see commercial development that's happened in Charlotte happen in Greenville. And um, just to give an example, Greenville is most known for its main street. All of downtown Greenville flows through its main street. Charlotte is not designed that way. And so uh, imagine trying to build up around the, the the downtown main street canopy and all of that. Like that that's a ludicrous idea. And even if you started to try to expand out from there, again, it would be just the way Greenville's la- laid out. I don't see how it could happen. But more importantly, that's just my opinion. But to get to get away from my opinion, we already know what the Greenville City and Greenville County councils have in their master plans and that they aren't going to allow this type of development to happen. You guys can go look at it. Those master plans are right out there. They are public knowledge. They are public record. You can go look at it. They are not planning and not in any way going to allow a Charlotte-like period of growth over the next few decades. Uh, Granted, the master plan is not made to go out several decades, but but for the, the current term, and remember, more people are getting into office that are NIMBYs on the local level, so they're certainly not going to create new master plans that overturn that and, and create less development. We are just not going to see Greenville turn into Charlotte. That's a straw man argument, in my opinion. I don't like it. Um, nobody needs to be worried about that. So the long story short for this argument is that people use this argument because they found out that a developer wants to build 250 homes in Simpsonville near their house. And they're like, we don't want to be like Charlotte. A developer building 250 homes in Simpsonville doesn't mean that Greenville is going to become Charlotte. Stop using that argument. Um, I'm fine if you want to have an argument about smart growth, but an argument like that is a straw man simply designed to scare people. It's scaremongering. um, It's bad logic. Don't do it. Um, another major concern that I have is our infrastructure is crumbling. And if there is one concern that the NIMBYs have that pretty much everyone agrees with, it's that infrastructure has struggled to keep up with developments, particularly, and we've talked about this in the past, in rural and more and lower income, more depressed areas. In these areas, we commonly can see issues with roads, with sewer systems, with things like that. And so um, the compromise that has been frequently trotted out is what we call impact fees. Impact fees, basically when a uh, the developer of a community pays to improve the infrastructure in the area that they are building in. Uh, infrastructure being roads, being sewer, things of that nature. The problem with impact fees, because it sounds good, right? It sounds good for the developer to come in and to and to pay for these things, right? If they're the ones that are bringing in this new housing, why don't they help to improve the infrastructure? Well, um, the problem is, for me, I, I lean more libertarian in my belief set, and that actually makes a lot of sense if you're a libertarian, a, a fiscal libertarian. This would be a classic fiscal libertarian solution to this problem. But it's not a perfect solution because what ends up happening is that the impact fees obviously increase the cost of building, which then increases the cost of buying. It's not like the developers just absorb that cost. That cost then gets baked into the price of the development. And guess what? If you pull NIMBYs, and we've done this in Greenville, um, I can't get into specifics of the poll because it's off the record, but I know that it's been done. And here's what happens. If you poll them, they always say that housing has gotten too expensive and that uh, housing affordability is a major concern for them. Uh, But then when you stop the the building of new housing, which is what they want, right? They want to stop developing in their backyard and you force those then who are developing to pay more via these impact fees, guess what that does to housing? It makes the price of housing go up. So the NIMBYs have have no, uh, they, they, they can't be happy, right? Because they want development to slow down or stop, particularly near them, 
but they also don't want housing to get more expensive at the rate that it that it's been growing. Well, guess what? You can't have your cake and eat it. You you have to do one or the other, um, or you have to come up with more creative solutions. And they, you just you talk to them, and they don't have those creative solutions. I've I, I don't mean to keep making fun of this this one local politician, but the idea, uh, the slogan that was trotted out last year by one of them, we need more parks, not more apartments. It, that's just that's just reductionistic. That's reducing the problem down to just way too simple of an issue. It's much more complex than that. There's also a question of whether it's fair and equitable for those who have lived in an area for a while to get a free improvement to their infrastructure paid for by developers. Shouldn't existing homeowners, if they're getting uh, their local infrastructure improved, shouldn't they contribute something towards that? Um, As we uh, are having governments more concerned about equity, that is something to be considered. Particularly, you get developments in some of these more rural and lower income areas. Um, That's something that needs to be balanced out. Uh, because let's say that you're having a development that is trying to offset gentrification, that's trying to allow people that are that are being forced out of a part of, of Greenville or, or Spartanburg or whatever, trying to allow them to stay within their community. Well, guess what happens? They're, they're being pushed out by wealthier people, right? The people that are causing the gentrification. Well, if those people that are causing the gentrification now are saying, not in my backyard... I don't want these developments to happen. Uh, I don't. Our infrastructure is not good. Well, okay, I'll allow it as long as impact fees are being paid by the by the developers. That means that the wealthier people are now pushing the cost burden on the poorer people uh, that already have the issue of gentrification at their hands. So we have an equity problem in some of these uh, when it comes to some of these things that a lot of NIMBYs, a lot of NIMBYs are social, socially liberal, but they don't consider the implications of uh, of what they're suggesting, of what they're trying to push through in these county councils. Um, now, again, I'm not disagreeing with the infrastructure argument. The road situation in South Carolina is a problem, particularly in these lower income and rural areas. And this is Common knowledge. We've known this for quite some time. In fact, uh, Nikki Haley, who is now running for president, was the governor of South Carolina, introduced a gas tax years ago. I remember getting a postcard in the mail that said, fix our roads, gas tax. Well, then she realized it was a very unpopular uh, thing. And so she completely reversed course and decided not to do the gas tax. But, um, and and, uh, to be completely honest, I I just want to say this. That could be seen as flip-flopping, and it was flip-flopping, but she actually listened to her constituents, and I did appreciate that about Nikki Haley, was that she did listen to the concerns that people had, Um, and like her, love her, hate her, indifferent, whatever, um, I, I think it's just worth saying that that was a that was something that for me I did not see that as a flaw with her I didn't see her as a perfect governor by any stretch but I felt like that was actually a strength of her administration not a weakness that's very much an aside um, but the gas tax did end up going through once Governor McMaster came into office and again the whole thing was to fix our roads but guess what it hasn't worked out super well I I've, I've not heard anyone that's like oh man. Look at all these roads that were fixed by this gas tax. It hasn't happened. It just, you know how these taxes work. They they end up not being used the way they're said that they're going to be used. Um, and with inflation being where it is and gas being so expensive now, nobody is going to want more gas taxes. And uh, and so, again, how are we going to improve our infrastructure People are like, well, we only have one choice. If we're not going to raise taxes, we're going to tax the developers with these impact fees. I don't think that those are the only solutions. We have, in the past 10 years, all of these new uh, potential revenue streams for governments open up. Why not open up the state for sports gambling? Guys, it's already happening. I don't care if you have a moral thing against sports gambling. It is happening under the radar, but the state of South Carolina isn't getting their cut of it that all of these other states that have legalized it are. South Carolina is behind in that. Why couldn't we allow for, for gambling in the state and then devote that money towards roads and towards infrastructure? Uh, 
Th this one's probably a little more controversial, but I'll mention it anyway. Why not weed, right? I told you I was libertarian. Um, I don't do weed myself personally, but I I don't see you know they the uh, all of the negative press that it got for all of those decades back in the day. So much of it ended up just being propaganda. It ended up being wrong. And you can go back and look at that yourself. But people are smoking weed. You can smell it everywhere. And I'm not just saying in, in Greenville. I've been in other parts of South Carolina. I've been in North Carolina and Georgia, Tennessee. You go anywhere, you smell weed. People are smoking it illegally in the state. Why not make it a regulated industry? And maybe you put limitations on it. But again, there are revenue streams that could come into the state that because South Carolina is just a bit more old school, they aren't um, they aren't accepting those. And so everyone is just thinking too much in this box of and not thinking outside the box and thinking, OK, well, we have only one solution here, and that is that we need to uh, make developers pay impact fees. Not a fan if we have these other options at our disposal. Um, and we can potentially employ those things so that the cost of housing doesn't continue to go up at the rate that it is. Whew. Okay, as you can tell, I'm passionate about this. I'm getting, uh, my, I'm starting to feel my voice getting scratchy, but I'm not done. I st I got more to go here. Um, okay, I said I wasn't going to make fun of this uh, again because I mentioned this before on my podcast, but I I'm, I'm going to bring it up again. Another concern, we need more parks, not more apartments. As I mentioned before, this was a campaign slogan by someone who was elected to Greenville County Council, and it couldn't be further from the truth, in my opinion. As housing has increased, so has the cost to rent in Greenville County. The cost to rent has gone up dramatically in recent years. And it might not make sense to someone who has been a homeowner for a long time or someone who comes from a background of privilege, but more apartments are necessary to keep the cost of rent in check. It, that is just the way it is. That is how we're able to keep rent in check is by having apartments. That helps to keep rent from getting out of control in an area. With regard to parks, look, we all like parks. Greenville County is unique. Uh, because within and near Greenville City, there are a bunch of parks. North of Greenville, there's Paris Mountain State Park. That's really our only state park in the area. Uh, south of Greenville is Lake Conesty Nature Preserve, a great free park to walk around um, that, that I highly recommend to people if they want a more flat area to, to walk around. It also connects with the Swamp Rabbit Biking Trail. Um, and, and of course, we've got Falls Park, right, in Greenville City. Uh, right in the heart of downtown, uh, the the uh, the apple of our eye when it comes to Greenville. What everyone thinks of when they think of Greenville is Falls Park. Um, but people in rural areas, they're just never going to have as much access to park. I don't parks. I don't care what you say. If you think we need more parks, the people in rural areas aren't going to get them like Greenville City has them. Why? Because the people in the rural areas have more land. Their lots are larger. And when lots are larger, parks become less feasible to build. How are you going to build a park when everyone in the area owns multiple acres or, or maybe even half acre point seven five acre lots? You just look at the, if, if you look at the lots in these rural areas, you realize there's just not public land to build on. To, to create a park. And there has to be public land for it to happen. Um, and most of the public land in Greenville County is in city limits. So that's just the reality of the situation. Greenville's done a great job of using undevelopable land to put these parks in. It's really fantastic. Uh, like Lake Conesty Nature Preserve, for instance, you could not use that land for anything because of, of the flooding in that area. So let's turn it into a really cool area to walk around in and enjoy the, the water of that area. So um, it's just unique once you get into these rural areas, um, it, you're not going to have more parks. Um, in, the, in the more urban areas and in some of the suburban areas, you do have them, uh, but you need more apartments in those areas. And, and what I think, really think people are saying when they say that they are concerned about too many apartments is that they don't want more neighbors. And I get it, okay? It's particularly hard for those who lived in what was a rural area for so long, such as Simpsonville 
for instance. Simpsonville was rural for so long. Five Forks was rural for so long. Um, Greer was rural for so long. Not Greer City, but uh, the areas of, around uh, the, the more... The, the areas further away from downtown Greer were rural for a long time. People had, you know, potentially great views of a lake or or, or tr- great mature trees around them. And that eventually all changed due to the d- developments moving in. But development is about the future. The NIMBYs, although they will make their claims acting as if they are concerned about the future, are primarily focused on the now. They are not thinking about the future. We're having people moving to Greenville at an unprecedented rate. And again, where do they live? Do we want more homeless? I don't think the NIMBYs want more homeless. The NIMBYs have already said that they don't want the the cost of housing to go up. Well, guess what? When demand increases and supply doesn't increase, prices go up. And so that's exactly what we're seeing. Um, But I also think that they're just wrong about What ends up happening in in the instance where we have uh, these big developments happening? I think they just only see what they've heard, these awful stories about what it's like having, you know, a big neighborhood near them. A big neighborhood is being built down the street from where I used to live. And there was a massive backlash against the, the people that sold that land to that developer. I mean, it took forever, tons of hearings for it to finally get approved. And it was approved against a lot of vocal NIMBYs uh, going to those meetings and packing out standing room only in some instances in those meetings. Even friends of mine who aren't normally politically active went to those meetings to protest the development. It was shocking. Non-political people got political just to oppose development in their backyard. And guess what? It happened. It got approved. And the the developer had to rework the roads to make the development work. And guess what? Now the main road that cuts through that area is so much nicer and substantially better for the traffic than than what was there before. This is what I'm saying. They improved the infrastructure. And those people, they're never going to have issues with those neighbors. If anything, probably now they'll see more better stores and better commercial development popping up in areas more accessible to them that won't hurt them in any way. It's not going to be clearing out forests or, you know, causing them to not have a a lake view or whatever the case may be. It's going to just make the area a lot better. And so the NIMBYs are wrong. Um, And in the end, I think we need to consider a few things before we let our emotions Get the best of us, particularly if you're tempted with the the sin of NIMBYism. Not a sin, uh, but I'm going to call it a sin. It's a real estate sin, okay? We need to consider a few things. First off, what will the next generation, our children, be able to afford? What will they actually be able to afford from a housing standpoint? In 2007, the price per square foot was $84.76 with a median sales price of $151,500. In the final six months of 2022, the median price per square foot was $168.91, almost exactly double, okay, in 15 years. And the median sales price was more than double, $342,700. So from a price per square foot standpoint over a 15-year span, we saw a 200% increase, even though the Great Recession was right in the middle of that. I think it's important just to just to caveat that. Um, but we saw a 200% increase. Um, in, if prices increase 200% in the next 15 years, then the average price per square foot in 2038 will be 300 $37.82. That's a luxury home in Greenville currently. $337 a square foot. That's a luxury home uh, by current standards. Um, and and I mentioned that wages haven't kept up with those increases. The median U.S. wages in 2007, this is the, in, in the U.S., um, was $36,000 uh, per household. And the median in 2022 was $56,000 per household um, nowhere near the, the 200% increase that 
housing saw during that period of time in the Greenville area. And um, if I polled the median South Carolina wages between those two time periods, I wouldn't be surprised if the increase was even less for South Carolina. So how will our kids afford housing? The only way is if we build more to increase supply and slow the price increases of housing. Listen, housing is going to continue to increase in our area because demand is going to continue to increase, but we need to slow it down. It can't be increasing at this exponential rate. And the there's really a simple solution. You need to build. You increase the supply to offset the increase in demand. Secondly, we need to think ethically and morally here as well. I've already alluded to this a little bit um, in this show, and I've talked in previous episodes about how zoning has a racist history. The concept of zoning in cities and counties is inherently racist. Now, I know that nowadays it's not said to be used for racist reasons, but historically speaking, it was used for racist reasons to keep white and black people segregated. Well, uh, again, the NIMBYs are t- oftentimes socially liberal, although they're not limited to that. Um, but the NIMBYs might not realize it, but when they push develop- developments out, developers tend to then target areas that won't push back as much, right? The developers know that there's a market. They want to build, and th- and they need to build, right? For the reasons I've already outlined. And so they get pushed out of uh, a, a wealthy area that has the ability to push them out, that has the sway with local politicians to do that, that understand this, the process and that are, are able to find ways and, and pull the right levers to get that developer to, to give up and to, to move out. Well, the developer moves on to where? What do you think? Where do you think the developer then decides to target? They decide to target the areas that won't push back as much. Guess what those areas are? They tend to be areas that don't have as much money. And so and because the, the people that aren't as wealthy, the, the poorer population, they don't have the resources to push back. They don't even understand to push back. Uh, it's just not a concern for them uh, to this whole idea of nimbyism. Like they have much bigger concerns than that. And so what ends up happening is that developers typically pushed out from wealthier areas into lower income areas. And then the fallout from this dynamic can result in functionally socioeconomic segregation. We're having the wealthy people pushing out uh, development into the poor areas, forcing poor people to continue to live among poor people, right? Because that's what these developments then are are ending up being uh, used for is workforce housing and things like that. And so we result in de facto segregation happening. And I think, honestly, if you really dissect it, why a lot of people don't want more neighbors is that they don't want, and I'm I'm not using this terminology, I'm saying from their perspective, they don't want the riffraff to be around them. They're concerned uh, what these new neighbors are going to be, that they're not going to be the, the same quality uh, neighbor as them. Again, that's not my perspective. That's what I'm saying, that, that a lot of these wealthy NIMBYs are concerned about is that they don't want what they perceive to be riffraff to be near them. And that's a a major, major problem at the heart of this. And so we're seeing those racist zoning roots rearing their ugly head back when it comes to people stonewalling developments. Um, And by the way, um, you know, it's also worth mentioning that then when developers do end up in these lower income areas, um, there might not be the the pushback with regard to infrastructure. And, I, and I'm not saying that developers aren't without their flaws. Um, if uh, developers aren't going to be forced to help the, the infrastructure, they're not going to do it. Um, and these are areas that are typically already neglected from a tax dollar standpoint. So something has to be done. Um, 
And, and so you do get more of these developments without the infrastructure improvements oftentimes. And so it's disproportionately hurting uh, those with a socioeconomic status that is uh, not at the level of those that stonewalled the developments in their wealthy neighborhoods or in their wealthy parts of the upstate. Um, now, I do want to say, I'm not saying that everyone who opposes a development is a racist, okay? I'm not saying that. You guys know that that is not my MO. Um, but we need to consider the consequences of our actions and the stances that we take. We just need to consider that. And I'm not saying that every development needs to, to be approved. Not saying that either. We, we shouldn't just automatically just say, okay, Ryan Holmes wants to build a new development. Okay, do it. Approve it. DRB wants to wants to do a new development. Okay, let it go through. No, there needs there does need to be smart growth, but people that are just opposing anything in their backyard, um, they they need to consider the consequences of their actions might actually not look much different than what the consequences of blatant racists that that put in zoning laws to create redlining, greater segregation, and things of uh, of that nature. Not the heart, but the consequences. And the consequences are still important. So in the end, I believe the arguments that the NIMBYs make are wrong and short-sighted. That is my personal opinion. I've argued against several of their arguments. I know that there are more arguments. I, I, this wasn't an exhaustive list. But at the same time, if you are anti-development, particularly in your area, I'm still willing to talk to you about it. I'm not going to call you names. I'm going to have a respectful argument. I'm willing to discuss it. Let's have a conversation about it. Let's talk about it. Hit me up. And you can, because my contact information is in the show notes. You like that transition? Pretty good. Uh, my contact information is in the show notes. You can hit me up to discuss that, to discuss any of your real estate needs, because I'm a realtor here. And I like to help people find homes in the Greenville area. So please let me know if you're listening to the show or watching it on YouTube, please do whatever you can do by means of liking it, subscribing, leaving a rating, leaving a review, do all of those things. Hey, I appreciate you guys listening. If you've gotten to the end of this, give yourself a hand. This was uh, this is a very niche episode. Not everyone's going to listen to this, uh, but I appreciate you guys listening. Uh, thank you. Stay safe. We will talk again next time.